because I used to buy a football pool, football and baseball pool, from my uncle Jack, who was from West Virginia, the only holy that, that I ever knew, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, one day after that incident, where I told you, that I told Lorraine that uh, let's leave Hawaii. We started to save money, and one day, uh, football season, uh, I won two. It's a thousand dollars a piece, and that it was like. Somebody up there likes me, you know, and with that, uh, it uh, accelerated uh, our ability to move to the mainland. That's right, gambling money helped to fund the future Hawaii governor's pursuit of higher education on the West Coast. It was a twist of fate in the lives of Ben Cayetano and his wife at the time, Lorraine. More on the life of former governor Ben Cayetano in his own words, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, we continue our conversation with former Hawaii Governor Benjamin Cayetano. He's retired from politics, but maintains the same tough mindset he had while running our state for two terms. In his book, Ben, a memoir from street kid to governor, his candor is fascinating, and he is no less so here on Long Story Short. He complains about Hawaii politicians who have little life experience, narrow horizons, and no appetite for making those tough calls. You know, you say something in your book that really surprised me. <laughs> I wonder, is this true where you say, and I think it was uh, until it was time for your second term as lieutenant governor? I mean. Everybody knows that lieutenant governor is often, not always, a stepping off point or spring, spring pad for governor. But mm -hmm. you never thought about it before that, seriously? When I, um, when I was in the Senate, uh, I was part of the dissidents. Neil Abercrombie and I, I were close in. Uh, 1986, I told Neil, Neil, you know, I'm leaving the Senate. And he, was, he said he's gonna leave the, the, the Senate also. And so he told me, Ben, I'm going to run for Congress. And I told him, I think you'd be a good congressman. And so what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go out and make money and, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, buy a, a nice home for my family and all of that. And he told me, you know, Ben, after all we've been through as, as dissidents, because we, we both got into the, the legislature in 1974, and here it is 12 years later, he said, we can't leave this place to them. And he's talking about the guys, you know, the establishment, you know. And that, uh, I, I thought about it, but politics is funny, you know, because once you get a taste of it, if you really um, uh, believe in, in, in public service, you sometimes say, you know, I can't leave this because I gotta do the, do the, the job this way and there are, not, there are not enough people in the legislature who believe as I do. And so Abercrombie, me, Toguchi, we, part of the dissidents, we all decided to stay in public service. So I ran for lieutenant governor, the only office that was open at that time, because I didn't want to go to Washington, D.C. And uh, what's interesting is that when I was a senator, I introduced a bill to abolish the office. <laughs> I, I didn't think uh, much of the office, you know, and all of a sudden here I am, I'm running for lieutenant governor. You know, these things happen. You never figure out why, but it, they, it happened. You know? And the lieutenant governor's office, as you pointed out in your book, is sort of what you make it. Yeah, it's what you make of it, and it, it's what the governor allows you to, to do. And John Wahey was very good to me. So when you mentioned lieutenant governor's running for governor, I never run against him. Because for all of the, you know, people had issues with him, uh, but I never did. Did he actively encourage you to be the next governor? No. Um, but uh, when when uh, we were both elected in 1986, he, he came to my office and he said, Ben, I was lieutenant governor for four years. I know how frustrating this office can be. So I want to work with you to, to get some things done. And... Uh, 
uh, I did the A-plus program for him. You know, coming from a former latchkey, mm -hmm. I always thought that was your idea. But in your book, you say, nope, that wasn't your idea. Well, the, the, you know, what happened was um, one day, uh, Y.A. called me. Ben, can you come over to my office? Charlie Taguchi is here. And Charlie was a uh, superintendent of education at the, at the time. So I, I go into the office and we meet three of us. And he says, um, Charlie says, uh, said that uh, Frank Fossey is uh, thinking about uh, developing an after school program in the city parks. Now, why he was thinking about the election, <laughs> you know, because Fossey uh, was a perennial candidate for, for, for governor. And uh, so, he's, so then John said, uh, well, he asked, he asked, he asked the Gucci, is this a big problem, Lashkey children? And, and Charlie said, yeah. About half of uh, the kids, about 30,000 estimated, uh, after school, they're wandering the streets, they go to the libraries, uh, you know, they go to the shopping malls, uh, or they go home, and nobody's caring for them. So how come we didn't do anything about it? That was why his next uh, question. Because we decided to leave it to the private sector. So then, Ben, can you put a, a program together? Well, I know how important it is because I was a last kid myself. So I said, okay, I will, we'll do something. And Charlie and I, because we're close, I, I knew that we could do something. And you came up with a name for it right away. Yeah. What, you know, in the end, he said, what will we call it? I said, how about A+. Plus? And it's, we call it the A-plus program. And uh, it was not easy to set it up because uh, I found out how rigid and inflexible the DOE bureaucracy is. You know, they were all opposed to it. Because? Because they didn't want us to use the classrooms. See, the teachers are very territorial about their classrooms. The thought of you know, it being open for an after-school program didn't sit well with, with many of the, the teachers. And so, uh, you know, uh, we had to get over that. And if Toguchi was not the superintendent, we would never have done it. Now, where I think that uh, uh, Wahe and I had a different approach was, he said, let's start a, a pilot program. And I told him, no, I don't want to do a pilot program because I know what's going to happen. You do a pilot program, even if it's successful, the rest of the schools will oppose it. So I said, let's do the entire system. And he looked at Taguchi and he said, he asked Taguchi, how many elementary schools are there, you know? And 140 or something like that. Charlie, do you think we can do it? I think we can do it. If not all, I think we can do most of it. And we did it, six months we did it. It was a little messy. A little messy. <laughs> <laughs> a, li a little messy, you know, the, some of the legislators got uh, and the Board of Education got a little bent out of shape because he was the lieutenant governor and the superintendent doing this by themselves. So Francis McMillan, who was a member of the Board of Education, publicly criticized uh, Charlie. He said, since when does the lieutenant governor run education in this state, you know? Uh, and then uh, we had some challenges from the, the legislature. But as soon as the idea got out, and, I, and this is what I find, you know, you, you got to communicate to the people that you're doing something. Because if we didn't, this program would never have gotten off the board. Because it didn't have any support. You know, the, I mean, the parents didn't know about it. It had only opposition. So once we said, we're going to do this after school program, we're going to charge, uh, I think it was a, a dollar a day or something like that, some crazy amount. Uh, then the parents started taking notice, you know, and pretty soon, uh, support for the program developed because we were able to show people uh, how great the need was. And myself, once I found out how many kids were at risk, it motivated me and Toguchi to put the program together. And, and we did. That's a perennial problem of politics, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You try to do something that you think is really good and instantly there so many people have a problem with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, what would happen is that the, the teachers and principals who were opposed to had their classrooms being used would complain to their legislators, you know, and then the, and the, the, the legislators would, would react. 
the, the edge that we had was the superintendent, Toguchi, was on board. You know, and so because we knew each other, we worked well together. The governor asked us to put, to put a committee together, and we did. And even the people in the committee were uh, reluctant, you know. So finally, it was a two-man committee, me and Charles Toguchi. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, it, it was one of the most rewarding things that I was ever involved in in politics because the first year, 20,000 kids. The next year, the program grew to 28,000. And uh, reviews by the parents were like 98% uh, uh, approval rating. Can't do better than that, man. Ben Cayetano grew up in a working class family on the hard edges of old Kalihi. His mother left the family when he was a young boy and his stepfather worked tirelessly to support Ben and his brother Ken. Living in the shadows of Ben Cayetano's life was his biological father, a man who never made an effort to spend time with or get to know his son. All of this toughened the Kalihi kid and helped shape his no-nonsense style as Hawaii's governor from 1994 to 2002. How do you get used to, in, in politics or, or in a, any position of leadership, being able to stand your ground? I mean, were you always like that, willing to defy or uh, deal with opposition, or did you have to learn it? I think my, um, I think my, my nature uh, and personality uh, kind of made it easier. But when I was a, a criminal defense lawyer, the client has only one person standing between him and prison, and that's his lawyer. And the lawyer has to believe that this guy is entitled to all of the rights under the, the Constitution. You got to believe that, otherwise you're not, you, you, know, you won't be serving your client well. And so when I was a criminal defense lawyer, I would defend people. And a lot of these guys are not the best people in the world, you know. And I would be subject to criticism, but you never, and then I learned how to live with it. Oh, people criticize me for defending this guy. But you know what? I believe there's honor in doing it because it's part of uh, the American tradition. What about in political decisions where people who are opposing you may have a point? I mean, you know, you're not always right or you're not completely right. How mm -hmm. did you handle that? Well, if they had a point, you know, and, and if they, they persuaded me that I was, uh, I was wrong or, it, you know, uh, it wasn't feasible, I'd back off. I've, I've done that, you know, at times. Uh, I don't mind when you talk about the merits, you debate the merits back and forth. What really used to get me frustrated was even though we make an argument for this or that uh, uh, proposition. The other guys, you know, it's when they say, well, we can't support it because the union is against it. Or we can't support it because this one group is against it, you know? Not tell us what the other side of the coin is. It's all political. And uh, that's very frustrating. And yet that's the job you had for decades. Uh, well, I had it uh, especially for eight years. How did you, I mean, as they say, it's lonely at the top. But it's a great honor to be at the top. You know, you, you get selected out of a population of 1.2 million people to be governor for eight years. Uh, there's honor in that. And you feel obligated and duty bound to do what you think is right. Now, like when I was a criminal defense lawyer, my, my client was this one guy charged with a crime. When I was governor, my client was the public. And so when, I remember when the teachers wanted 240 million uh, contract, you know, we couldn't give it to them because, and I tried to explain, if we agree to this, I'm gonna have to cut all these programs for poor people. And they basically said, well, we're gonna strike. Well, if you're going to strike, you strike. So they struck. And we, and we finally settled a contract for like half the, the, what they wanted, you know. And I think you, you, you cannot be effective if you covet the job, you know what I mean? If you say, this job, you know, I want this job and I want to be here forever, you know, because I, this is the biggest thing that happened to me. 
If you feel that way, you're not going to be affected. You always have to be willing to, to leave it. Right. You know, you got to be willing to leave it. Like, I'm going to make a decision, and that's it. You know, it's like, it's like uh, playing professional football, okay? You know that one day your day, your day is, you know, your, your playing time is going to be up. Well, while you're in there, just do the, be the, the very best you can. And that's, that was my philosophy. Well, you're a guy who has clear ideas and likes to execute. But politics is all about um, accommodation mm -hmm. and um, group. And, and uh, how, how did you get through that? How did you get good at that? Well, you know, most of the guys that I serve with, yeah, uh, they were reasonable people. Some of these guys were had tremendous life experience. Guys like Jack Sewer, uh, they had gone to war, you know. Uh, so they lived through some hard times, and they had all of this, this experience. Uh, they were also people who you could sit down and, and really talk about the marriage and demerits. Uh, Today is different. These kids in the legislature, and I call them kids because many of them have never worked at any job but what they're doing today. Mm -hmm. They were former staff members of uh, a senator or a representative, decided to make politics a career, and, then, and they're in it. What frustrates me about government, and which is why I wouldn't want to be in it today, you can't talk to these people. You cannot reason with them. That's why there's very little debate in the legislature. Senator Lassie Hara uh, made a comment a, a couple days ago on the uh, civil unions bill. He said, you know, it's such an important bill, but there's so little debate. People just voted. They, they vote, they vote on alliances. They vote on anything but merit. Whatever works for them politically, they vote that way. I can't put up with that. We, we've always had that, you know. But it's more pronounced today than ever. Why do you think that is? Well, one, one reason you don't have a lot of debate is these kids don't have any experience. So, you know, they, they can't get up and, or they're, you know, they, they worry about their, um, their pet projects. I had one guy, a former newsman, come in one day and talk to me and he said, you know, he didn't like what was going on with the leadership. So I said, why don't you say something? He said, well, otherwise they're going to kill my, my, my pork, you know, meaning the projects for his district. Well, if you feel that way, you shouldn't be in the business, you know. You got to do what's best for everyone. And I, and I try to tell him that, it still does, you know, he still doesn't say anything. Just sits there and do I get my swimming pool for my, you know, for my, my school. If I get that, that's all, that's, all, that's all I want. So limited the horizons of these young legislators are today. Very limited. Hmm. So, yeah, it, and it's, you think it's a function of, of simple experience and not having a broad outlook. Well, you know, I think events shape people. And if you were, you know, uh, if you were like Dan Inouye you know, and you were in, in a war, you know, those kind of things shape you in terms of what's important. The guys who went to war like Dan Inouye, you know, Tom Broca called them the, the greatest generation. They came back from the war and they built this country into the most powerful and richest uh, nation in the world. They had a, they had a, a goal, you know. These kids today, uh, they never had to struggle for anything. Because my generation gave them everything that, that they wanted, you know. There's a book called Generation Me, written by a couple of professors, and it talked about how this generation is different. If you don't run into adversity, if you don't, if you don't struggle, if you, you're not forced to postpone uh, instant gratification so that you can accomplish something later, when you come up and face adversity or face failure, uh, it's harder to do with it. Some of Ben Cayetano's other political stories in his book, Ben, a memoir from street kid to governor, are real grabbers. He names names of politicians who he feels let down voters. And Ben Cayetano isn't the only one in this political town with a long memory. 
he simply doesn't make it on all of those A-list social invitations. What's been the reaction to your book? I know a lot of people <laughs> at the legislature thumbed immediately to the index to see if you wrote about them and what you said, but you did skewer a few people in the book. Oh yeah, but, but you know, one thing that I tried to do was I said to myself, I'm gonna be honest and candid in this book and critical of people, but I'm gonna try, uh, I'm gonna really make sure that my facts are correct, that what I say is not out of pure spite, you know, but is borne out by the, by the facts. And not one of those guys have complained publicly about what I wrote, the ones that I criticize, because they can't complain. That's the way I look at it. You know, I, I use the, what they said in the newspapers, what they said in the, on the Senate floor, the House floor, uh, whatever they said publicly, you know, to, to make my point. I've heard a couple of people say about your book, just when is Ben going to mellow out? I mean, why does he always have to carry this chip on his shoulder? He's been the governor. Why does he carry this stuff around with him? <laughs> you know, uh, someone asked me if I miss holding office. I said no. The only thing I miss about it is not, try, not stopping some of the foolishness that these guys do, you know. Because too many things that I see today are being done uh, for political reasons, because people want to get from here to there, you know. And if you're so ambitious that you're always thinking about politics, then you're always going to be conducting yourself as if you're walking on the eggshells. Uh, I'm, you know, as far as my family is concerned, uh, I'm a mellow guy. But when it comes to public service, people need to hold other people accountable because there's, there are big stakes involved. So when people say that, I want to ask them, well, what did you do for the people? You know, you want everybody to shut up and not say anything? And that's why you don't have debate today because they, they don't want to say anything about each other. They complain privately, but that's about it. But when I wrote this book, one reason I, I did write it uh, was that I wanted to give people in the future, especially, uh, a glimpse of what life was like, at least during my time. And there's some big issues in the book, like the ceded lands and the Bishop Estate. Uh, you know, the, 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 I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not comfortable with the amount of scholarship that goes on in this, in this uh, state anymore. And I, if someone were to write about it, city land issue, I wanted to make sure that uh, they knew another side of the story because I was in the, uh, right on, on, on that issue when I was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in 1980, you know, and Dennis O'Connor and I, and, I, um, and I, I didn't like the way it was set up. And sure enough, the concerns that I had are shown today. In fact, you say in the book that you think the time for Hawaiian sovereignty has passed because of uh, a previous court ruling. Well, the, the, when the Supreme Court ruled in the Rice case, yeah, that uh, uh, o, uh, the OHA elections had to be open to everyone. Everyone could vote because the OHA law violated the 15th Amendment, which pre uh, prohibits uh, uh, race-based vo voting. Uh, I thought that um, there's no way that the Hawaiians are going to get the kind of sovereignty that, that they want because they want a nation that's only for Hawaiians. And how do you choose, you know, uh, how, how do you choose such a nation? Congress would have to pass a law that gives them the power to do it. Supreme Court says Congress cannot do it. You cannot have elections under United States law which are race-based. And so I think that uh, the whole sovereignty movement is, is develop a life of its own, and it's very difficult for the, the, the leaders to kind of say, let's forget about the idea. Unfortunately, young Hawaiians are gonna have to figure, out, figure it out for themselves. So uh, the book was, I, I wrote about those things because I want people to understand, uh, because I'm not comfortable with the kind of uh, academic inquiry that goes on in this town, whether at the legislature or uh, the newspapers. The newspapers are terrible today. They don't, you know, maybe it's the business, I don't know. And they weren't always terrible? They were better in the past, you know, I mean, uh, they would 
investigate, follow up on leads and things like that. Today, basically regurgitate the news. That's basically it. So what's ahead for you? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I told my wife, Vicky, that, uh, uh, you know, unless uh, we were, you know, in the poor house, I didn't want to go back to work as a lawyer. I've been out for a long, long time. And the only kind of law that I did was trial work. And that's very stressful. Uh, I don't want to be a consultant of any kind, you know. What about boards and commissions? Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to be serving on a board uh, It's unpaid. Uh, I forget the name of the, the, the organization, but basically it's an organization that uh, sets up programs in the schools for uh, uh, intermediate school uh, children, after school program, like A+. Plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting on that board with, uh, with uh, quite a few people uh, that are uh, well known. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm catching up on my reading. Uh, I, I'm learning a lot about different things that I, that I couldn't, uh, I didn't have the time to pursue when I was in office, you know. I have a ton of books at my, my, my house that I, that I haven't read uh, fully and I'm, I'm doing that. Ben Cayetano didn't pull his punches growing up in Kalihi, and he doesn't pull his political punches even well into retirement. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Hawaii's gruff, tough, fifth governor and author of a candid 560-page memoir. At this time, in 2009, he's comfortably retired and living in East Honolulu. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Uh, Neil Abercrombie, mm -hmm. your friend and ally, wrote a foreword for your book yeah. in which he quoted Shakespeare saying, every man has his fault and honesty is his. And he said, um, your virtue is your vice. <laughs> ben, play the game straight, he said. Um, is there any other way you could have played it? I don't think that um, it, uh, office, holding office would be worthwhile if I had to make all these accommodations just to keep the office.